each other in the chat. And we're going to, Rob, I'm going to ask the question, how do you want questions? Do you want to answer them while you're doing your presentation? Do you make pauses? How do you want to handle that? Well, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through um, as many as I can, but I've got five packages that I'm going to review. And maybe after each one of these packages after I've gone through the first one, we'll stop for questions about that particular deed. So I've got a, like a correction deed we're going to go through, and then I've got an espousal, then I've got a trust transfer deed. So I'm going to go through from like start to finish. <laughs> where we go from the first phone call from the client to recording the document. Okay, and then you'll give us a heads up when it's time to ask questions. And we're gonna ask everyone to put their questions in the question and answer section. And then Rob, you and I, we can read them off. Um, can you see them? Can you actually see them? I'll try to help you keep organized with them. I do, I have it here, yeah. All right, All right. we've got, it is now 12 o'clock straight up and we have a nice group before we get started, I want to introduce you to um, Loretta so that she can say a few words. She was so gracious as to allow us all as called to come and join their chapter meeting. Take it away, Loretta. Uh, hi, I'm Loretta Zudi from the, the citizens of the Iran Empire. And that's why I love Keldo, because we all learn from each other. And uh, Rob was gracious enough to do the deeds for us and for all of us, and we're one group. Uh, welcome, everyone, and I'm sure we're going to learn much uh, today. All right, Rob, it, it is your turn. Take it away. Loretta, you and I will mute ourselves and so that Rob can have the floor. Go for it, Rob. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Loretta. Um, so, yeah, what I'm going to do today is, uh, as I was just mentioning to Helen, I'm going to go through as much as I can here. I've got five packages listed. There are recent document packages that I prepared for customers. And and so what I always like to see the way I learn is step-by-step -step procedure from very start, how I handle the phone call when the client first calls me, or it, it, there's several ways that they first contact me, but from first contact to recording the deed. Right, so I'm gonna I'll go through um, each one of these different kind of deeds, and then when we're when I'm finished with that one deed, I'll we'll go for questions about that particular deed, and we'll go down the list as far as we can today. Um, but just just some background and some plugs for escrow, the escrow association. Right, I started at escrow. I was a notary public at an escrow title company here in San Jose. And uh, it was all I did was notarize deeds and documents and loan packages and, and review these packages with the client, with the new home buyer. This, this office was exclusively dealing with the builders when they built a brand new home and sold that. We, we deal with these people to go through their final docs. Um, and so from that, I was able to, to just a deed, the vision of the image of a deed and how it compacted and, and prepared it was just embedded in my head so I was very lucky in that and now all I do is deeds and the reason all I do is deeds is because it keeps me extremely busy and um, you know I can do I do 50 60 deeds a month and it all comes from the escrow uh, community so um, that being said if you want to build a business or a revenue stream based on deeds that's where you get the business that's your resource right there. That's your, you network with escrow officers. And to do that, you can look up the California Escrow Association and, uh, and and be involved, get involved with that. I personally have been with the Escrow Association in Santa Clara Valley for um, 11 years, ever since I started this business. And uh, and, and I, all the title companies in this valley send people to me. So if you can build that sort of relationship, You've got a whole business right there, and your, your revenues are, are built in. So that being said, what I'm going to try to do here is very specifically into the the, uh, the document preparation to see if this works. Zoom is kind of funny when you, when you share a screen. So I'm assuming everyone's seeing my full screen. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Okay, so um, 
The first one I'm going to prepare is one that it's done, it's signed, it's, it's in progress of recording. Um, uh, let's see if I can pull it up here. Okay. So the way I, the way the first contact works with me is that a, a customer will call me, uh, and, and if they call me on the phone, it means that they've been talking to real estate agents who referred them to me or referred them to a title company. And they talk to the title company, and the title company has referred them to me. Sometimes even the county will refer um, someone to me, uh, but the, the client will call the county to get help, obviously, or logically. Uh, but the county can't help them, of course, do this type of thing. So either way, I'm, I'm like at least the second or third call, and these people are just done. They, they, all they want to hear is, I can help you with that. I provide the full service, you know, and, and that's what I do. And, and so when I talk to them, I simply take notes, uh, very specific information about what I need to start the preparation, and their email, and I email them the Calda brochure and the uh, Calda questionnaire. Uh, property deeds questionnaire and they will fill that out some some people are tech technological technologically savvy they can fill it in it's a fillable pdf or they print it and fill it out manual and scan an email it back to me if not um, i also provide them with a link to my site where they can fill it out online and i get that sent to me through email so um, for instance in this particular person's situation um, he provided this questionnaire to me he printed it out and filled it in. And this is what he gives me, just all the basic information with the client name, contact, property information, what he's doing. This particular one was uh, an error, right? It was he he tried to do a deed years ago. Uh, and he got it recorded, but it was the wrong legal description and the wrong lot number. So he needs, he, this was pointed out to him by the county or maybe he was doing finance. Anyway, they, they pointed it out to him, and, uh, and then, then he called me to get it fixed. Uh, so you can see it's all the standard questionnaire. He's telling me what he needs me to do for it. And so what that does is it leads me to uh, just transpose that information into my general notes. So right, I boil all that questionnaire down to the key information the spelling of everyone's name, what's going on, what's happening, the contact information, APN. I do that because what I want to do is I set up a situation where I'm just filling in the blanks. I'm filling in a form for them based on the information that they provided me, right? So this is the information that I pulled from that questionnaire. And then the first document I prepare is, is, a, a, is the fee statement my fee statement, and that's this thing here. So this is just how I do it, how my fee statement looks. Um, and, and there's a header with all the information on it, the disclosures and everything. This, some of the disclosures are here, right? We need to have that on everything that we do. We are not attorneys, we cannot advise this. So all the information is in, the, in here. And then what I'm doing for him, the correction deed, the fees. Now this individual, he, uh, but normally what I do is I get all this drafted up, we meet in my office, I get the, I take care of the fees and then we meet. He wanted to pay this ahead, so he paid me by Zelle with this QR code that's embedded into the into the statement. Okay, so that's the, I, I kind of take care of that first to, it, it's logical for me to get everything boiled down to one thing. I'm doing a correction deed, right? And this is what it's paying me. And then, I prepare the, uh, the legal document assistance disclosure and um, contract, right? And I'm hoping everyone is using this, right? This is this, this is by law, right? 6400 says you have to use this format, um, word for word, right? This is the from the DCA. This is the disclosure. I have them sign this. All my pertinent information is plugged into the the blanks he signs this and then the contract right word for word we don't change this we can't change this is for what i understand this is a dca contract but what they're doing what i'm doing for them how much it's going to cost them and and then uh the signature page here 
Now, here's something that I've, I've added recently, and I, I like to plan ahead and, and get way ahead of things, right? So we all know what's going on with our 6400, the sunset clause. We're trying to get it extended. It's out of assembly, going to the Senate. Uh, we hope that it's, there, there's no glitches along the way. If there are, we we'll call upon you, right? Expect that if, if there's any issues. But watch for Chester's blog as well for updates. But the other next step is going to be um, working on the uh, expansion of the MCLE, right? Right now it's 15 units every two years. We want to get it into the 6400 that is 25. The extra 10 will be focused on on uh, MCLE, on the um, ethics, UPL, and the uh, 6400 knowledge or compliance, right? The other thing was some sort of a complaint procedure, right? That one of the, the, one of the issues that the bar wants, they want to have some sort of a method for the public, the legal consumer to re have repercussions. So what I've done to resolve that issue, and I'm starting ahead of the game, hopefully maybe the DCA will, uh, will and um, so this is what I did to to resolve that issue. Right? And so I added a page to the uh, contract, and I'm really doing a couple of things here. I'm communicating with my customers, telling them what they can expect next. If I've e-recorded the documents, which nine times out of ten I e-record, uh, and I go through this verbally when we meet, but I tell them they should email me within three business days. I'll respond to that email with the digitally stamped deed. It'll be digitally stamped at the top uh, top right corner, and they print that and attach it to the deed that I leave with them, the original I leave with them after we've signed and notarized. Because after I scan it in, I don't need it, and I can't keep originals per the contract, right, disclosures. So I'm letting them know what to expect and then what to do next and uh, letting them know because I, I get questions, well, when am I going to get the... the the title to the property. They, some people still think it's like they're going to get a pink slip sort of thing, right? Like you do with a card from the DMV. It's not the case. The last document recorded is the actual title to the property. So I let them know that. Um, I let them know if we're if for some reason we have to submit it to USPS certified mail that they can wait six weeks to six to eight weeks to get the original. I let them know they can give me some reviews on Yelp and Google. But this is where it's the important part is. I let them know if for some reason unlikely event that they're not satisfied with why the service I provided them and I haven't been able to resolve that issue that they've got some uh, they've got some uh, resources to, to draw upon with the Santa Clara County Clerk Recorder I've got the Better Business Bureau here the district attorney and the bar I think everyone should be confident enough to put that on their documents if they're not they need to button down and get into some of the conferences and some of the calendar resources to get trained up so you're very comfortable or also uh, take advantage of the mentor program and, and really get in there so you really know what you're doing and you're not going to run into trouble anyway. So that's the that's the next document I review with the client is this disclosure. So then I prepare the, um, the deed itself. And, and I've gone through, and what I have to do kind of as a, as a pre preliminary stuff, I need to pull deeds from the county. So I pulled this deed from the county that, see, he prepared it himself. And this document is incorrect. This is the Exhibit A that's incorrect that he needed corrected. So I had to confirm that. Then I had to pull what was the real deed, was the real dis, uh, legal dis, legal. Exhibit A, and it should be this one here. And I just went on to counting. I'm hoping everyone has a resource like that. If there are any resources out there, I happen to be able to use the title company that I used to work for. I can go on and pull any deed I want anywhere. Um, but all the deeds in the history of the document, or the history of the paper, the property. So this is then the actual correction deed that I prepared for this individual. So at the top, all, that's the stamp. That's my stamp, right? My company name, the registration number, the expiration date, Calda number, where the county's going to be mailing any future correspondence, the correct APN number, and then what we the language the county wants to see in a correction deed is 
very specifically, it's, it's not it's not elaborate, it's very simple. It just says this is intended to correct the lot number in exhibit A of the subject property on the document number, and that's the document number that the client recorded in the beginning that had the error on it. File for record on this date, that was when it was recorded. And then, then it's just a matter of repeating what that deed did. He went from himself. Now the other thing too was um, he made some errors in the way that was the was the way it was worded. He wanted to be on title as Keith Jeffrey Hawker, but on the previous deed he was only Keith Hawker uh, and Michelle Hawker. So we needed to to disclose to the county where the name difference came from and why. Uh, and then he's on title. He was coming out of his trust, uh, probably preparation for a marital dissolution, but. He wanted to be on title as Keith Jeffrey Hawker, an unmarried man. And then Keith had to sign it here, and I notarized his signature. But then, in this case, Michelle was off somewhere, and she, she wasn't available. Um, and uh, so right in this minute, this document is out for a signature. And then there's the correct legal description of the property. Okay. So again, that's just an example of a correction deed and the language that's necessary at the top. And, and again, it does not have to be elaborate. It's very simple. What is going on? What what the error was, what's correcting, what the document number was that had the error, and when it was recorded. And you just repeat what was in the deed in the beginning, in the first deed that was needs to be corrected. So you're doing it all over again just with the proper information on the Exhibit A. Okay. And then... Um, and then everyone knows about the preliminary change of ownership report. Um, just just data entry for the county, with all the information necessary. And what we're doing here is in the exclusion for reassessment section, part one, uh, is letting the county know what's what it, what it is. This is the correction for the lot number. And it also comes to or from a trust. So we want to tell the county any kind of information we can so that he's not going to get reassessed for this for this document, for this recording. And so that's that. That's that deed. So uh, we can we can stop with there. Are there any questions specifically on that correction deed and the procedures? Uh, Rob, we have some questions in the chat. One of the questions is how do you e-record when the uh, within the county what title company do you use to gain access to the deed? So how do you e-record with the county? Let's start there. Okay. Yeah, so e-recording with the county, I do it with a company called Simplify. Uh, now, there are other uh, companies out there that, that you, I, I don't know the names of them anymore. There was one that I was using for a while that um, you could send them a deed and they would e-record it for you, but you had to, FedEx the original to them, they would e-record it, and then the, they would get the, uh, the, the recorded document back out to the client. Um, that was kind of a cumbersome, but uh, that company went out of business. There may be others out there that do that, one or two deeds here and there. I use Simplifile, and Simplifile, you, you kind of got to go through a procedure to get it, get it, get it approved by them. There's all sorts of MOUs for different uh, counties you have to uh, sign up with, sign contracts, MOU is Memorandum of Understanding, and just you're declaring that you're legit, you're not going to commit fraud, you're preparing deeds uh, appropriately, and you're qualified to do so. Um, so Simplify, though, has a minimum of like 50 deeds a month to, to be able to sign up with them. At least that's the way it was a couple of years ago when I signed up. You might check with them, Simplify, it's called SIM. E L I F I L E. So that's the that's the e-recording service, and it's a great thing. It's just amazing. I I have a portal, a tab on my browser. Um, I log in. I tell them what county I want to record in. I name the file. I upload the the document as as I scanned it in. It has to be scanned in at a minimum 300 DPI. Um, so I upload it from, from my files and, and uh, hit submit and it gets recorded. Unless there's issues, and inevitably there's little bits and pieces here and there, and just correct it and and, and resubmit. I love I'm sorry. And then she asks, 
What title company do you use to gain access to the deeds? Yeah. Um, now, there are, there are multiple resources out there for that as well, and I think I've seen it uh, mentioned on the forum. I personally use First American Title, but that's because that's the company I worked for for eight, almost nine years before I went into business for myself, right? So um, that's how I have access to that. And all the title companies, though, if you can develop a relationship with them, all the title companies have a resource like that uh, that they actually – they basically give this for free to uh, like all their like their best agents that are sending them the most business and their brokers. It's kind of a perk for doing business with them. Um, so uh, so that's where that resource is. But again, there are independent resources out there. You might have to pay them a dollar fifty per deed or something like that. I don't know what the charges are. Whatever it is, it's worth it though. By the way. Uh, because you know you, it's 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 invaluable to have this deed sitting here in front of me and my ability to just pull it up in 30 seconds so that I have all this information I need to prepare the document properly for for the customer. Uh, okay, so. we have another uh, question. First off, people are wanting to know whether or not you can send them a copy of the documents that you're discussing. And then other people are asking if you, when you go through to widen your screen, um, we can see your desktop, but the uh, information that you're providing us is a little small. Does that sure. make sense? Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll give that a shot. And, and, then, and then another question has to do with, do you have to mail the p separately to the assessor's office? Okay, yeah, no, the p um when, when in the Simplifile system, when we upload the deed, we do we upload the deed first, and then there's a like a field to click on to upload the PCOR. and there's even a field to upload um, the documentary transfer tax affidavit if that is applicable in that particular county. So those type of documents all go go in together. The documents that do not. If you needed to say submit a claim for reassessment exclusion for a transfer between parent and child, and and now the county's new requirement that that exemption form go along with that, that I I submit to the assessor's office separately. But no, the PCOR and the documentary transfer tax affidavit and the deed all get uploaded to the county. And I I know we have to keep moving on, but here's another question with reference to the fees. How do you charge the fees for the recording? Um, okay, so on my statement, it includes the recording fees. Let's pull that up again. Now, let me see. I'm going to widen this up so hopefully um, we can see it a little better. Is that is that better to see that that way? Yes, much better. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So this is the fee statement. So I have this. Um, it, it all just totals out automatically in, in Excel, but uh, I have my, my preparation fee here. Uh, I, my base fee for these type of documents is 300 uh, plus the recording fee, and this is that recording fee. Now, this document here was that correction deed, and the correction deed, there's the rules for fees in the, in the county for recording. If this is an owner-occupied property and, say, your some kind of title is being changed, uh, the owners or whatever, the, the recording fee is $25 plus $3 for every page attached to that, like for a Exhibit A and all that. If it's a non-owner occupied property, or if there's no change in ownership, which this is no change, it's just a correction, the county is going to charge that SB2 fee of $75. So that's where I collect the, um, the uh, recording fee on that statement. And then it gets charged to me through Simplifile when I upload the document. Um, I, I charge $10 for the e-recording because I'm, I'm charged for, for e-recording. Every document I submit, they, they charge me for that. And then I charge them $25 for the document request. I was requesting the deeds through that portal. Um, so that's just my very basic fee structure. Rob, we do have a lot of questions, but I do realize that you have to go to the next section because we only have an hour. Okay, yeah. A lot of questions. Now, as far as templates go, yeah, you can maybe email me and I can send you 
um, the templates I use. So all my templates, if I can show you this, let's see. Um, I, I try to keep things very organized and at my fingertips because I, I'm, a, I'm production, right? I'm producing a, a product and you have to be efficient at that, just like Henry Ford did when he built his assembly line. You have to have everything so that it's as, as, most, as efficient as possible. So um, let's see, what was I looking for here? Oh, the templates. So uh, I have everything in in one file here. So that all the, the grantee templates, uh, this was some other power of attorney grantee, um, affidavit of an insured, correction deed, affidavit of death. So I can, I can send you these basic templates if you want me to. Um, so if you would just email me and I'll, and I'll send you the, the deeds that, that you need. Okay. Um, so let's go back on the second uh, document that I wanted to go through was one that I finished recently as well. It's the same thing, right? In this case, uh, the, the questionnaire that I received from the client was through that online portal. Let's see. I'm trying to expand this. Um, so when somebody goes onto my website and goes into property transfer questionnaire, they can fill all this stuff out online. And when they come to the bottom of the page, they have to do, I'm not a robot and submit. And then I get the email and I copy and paste that email into word. And then I format it to print. And this is what comes out. And then this is what I use instead of having to go through that handwritten questionnaire and creating a, a, the notes, the separate Word document, I just use everything here. So their contact information, the property address, APN number, and then she's telling me that uh, this is a primary residence, so I know what the recording fee is gonna be with that. In this case, uh, husband and wife are on title, and um, right, she's transferring to a spouse. So what's happening is uh, the this husband is coming off title and then and the wife is going to remain on title i believe that's what it is and and so right it's not a parent to child transfer it's not a legal entity it's they want me to do a quick claim deed so i did a quick claim deed i don't like to because i provide them with some information about how to make a decision whether it's a grant deed or a quick claim deed i cannot tell them right obviously but i let i give them enough information so they can make that decision now in this case um here it says in some of the notes that I pulled from the email chain that uh, she received the information about outlining quick play problems and she agrees, but um, the her opposing counsel, right, the husband's counsel wanted it to be a quick claim deed. But so be it. That's what I do for them. So this is the this is the format that I start with with the questionnaire. And then I go through the same process, right? I go through and create a uh, so that was, I create the, the fee statement. This is way small. All right, so it's pretty much the same information on the fee statement uh, with the contact information at the top. Again, it's the $300 for the base fee. In this case, she's occupying the property, so it's only $30 for recording. Uh, and then down here, I, I take credit cards too, but I, I charge a, like a surcharge for that. So if telling, it automatically calculates this. Um, you know, say there was another e-recording or another was a mobile notary fee, right? It automatically calculates that fee and what it would be if they have to use a credit card with a three and a half percent surcharge for the credit card. So again, I just pulled all the information out of that questionnaire format. And uh, let's see. And then the same, the, the same, the, uh, the contract and the disclosure, all the same information here. So when I'm filling this out, it's just, it's only a few fields that I really need to pop in there. It's this, the names of the signers, right? the what i'm doing for them quit claim deed removing spouse right and the, the fees that i charge and their signature line at the bottom here as well and all this is still the same here 
So it's very quick, right? It's it's quick to fill out the the fee statement and the legal the uh, contract, legal document uh, assistant contract. And in this case, here's the deed. This deed here, actually, it's a quick claim deed. Yeah. And there's very little difference in a grant deed and a quick claim deed. It's just the language, right? In this quick claim deed, it says hereby revise, release, and quick claim to, as opposed to the grant deed, which says hereby grants to. You know, so it's it means something different to some big underwriter at a title company or a lender, um, and that's so that's why I try to give them as much information about that to let them know if they may not want to use that versus an interspousal deed. But the the attorney was assistant on that, so. So Stephen Wilkes, spousal grantee, hereby revises, revised, release, quick claim to uh, Karen Ann Wilkes. The divorce is not final. So um, she's still going to be on title as a married woman as her sole and separate property. So Stephen will sign this. Or let's see, I wonder, you know what, they did sign this. Um, so that's the deed and the preliminary change of ownership was there as well. Now. When when the document does record, let's see if I've got it here. This, this is what the document looks like when it records. So what I did was is I uploaded the signed document through Simplifile. Right, it's all signed and notarized here. And this up at the right top right corner is what Santa Clara County does. They digitally stamp it at the top here. That means it's done. It's recorded. And, and I download it from that simple file site and I forward it to the clients. They attach it to the originals that I left with them when they met me at my office. And, and that's it. Right, so each county will have a different stamp, but that's basically what happens. And it's very quick. I'll, I'll submit the, uh, I'll upload the document to simple file and record within a day or two. Um, usually the next day, depending on what time, there's a cutoff time during the day, but, um, and then there are counties you'll learn that aren't as quick, like L.A. County. They take a little longer to do things, many days, maybe a week. Um, but most counties are very quick at it. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the quick claim deed part of it. Any any questions on that one? Not. I'm uh, diligently trying to get through your questions. Some I. I have a question for you. I'll use this one. Sometimes when you need to submit a letter of explanation with the P-Corp, how do you handle that if you e-file the reporting? Is there a letter of explanation separately? You know what? I've never done a letter of explanation separately. Never, ever, ever done that. Um, I, I, I would imagine that whatever explanation you might be able to draft into the language on the face of the deed, right? Like, what I do here, I have on this quick claim deed that it's occupied, that there's no mortgage, that it's a transfer between spouses. Um, I, I, like I said, I've never, never, ever had to do a letter of explanation. I, uh, family, I placed Rob's email and his website address in the chat. And Rob, we're going to ask you just one more time to just kind of make your screen just a little bit bigger. We are older people. And we can see it, but we cannot read what you you actually have, if that makes any sense. That is better. I see it better. Hopefully everybody else does too. So why not? We're at 1232. Why don't you go ahead and continue to your next deed, please? Okay. All right. Let's see. All right. The next one is uh, the one that I did recently here. And it is, uh, I think it's a trust transfer deed. So this one here, the questionnaire came in uh, as it, it came in through the website. So it's a condominium, they're occupying the property. They're both on title. And basically all they're doing here is they're transferring to themselves as trustees of their trust. Let's see, I'm hoping I'm getting this big enough for y'all, right? Um, so it's all very basic. It's just a simple, very good, very simple transfer to a trust. And I have them ready to sign. So, um, so the, the, that's not it, the fee statement. All 
right? So the thief statement then was very similar to the last one, right? It was it was uh, base 300. They're occupying the property. I certify or I emailed the, or I e-recorded the documents. I pulled the recent file, recent deed from from my portal. Um, the same the same uh, legal document, assistant contract. Um, then the deed itself. This is this is pretty large here. So the same stamp at the top always. Contact information, trust transfer. Uh, they're transferring to their trust, dated this date, and they are occupying the property. So they're on title as husband and wife, as joint tenants. They're going straight into their trust. They'll sign it, notarize it, and there's the legal description as well. Um, now, the other thing that I can show you here, and then they, of course, there's a PCOR along with it. Uh, and then when, I, when I'm meeting with the clients, right, I, all this, this short stack of paper is signed, and then I scan everything in to, the, to, to my system here. And this is what I end up with, right? It's the signed uh, fee statement, signed and initialed questionnaire, the disclosure, the contract, and the deed. Right, and then from this, from, this is just a PDF file, right? From this, I will pull this deed out, and I will. That's where I will upload to the county to record, right? And the PCOR. So that, that this is what all work basically boils down to. This this uh, PDF file with the scanned finished documents, and I'm hoping, yeah, and I uploaded to the county, and this is what came out. Right. This is what the county, they stamped it at the top. I forward this to the, to the customer. They attach it to that original that I left with them. Um, and, and that's that's it. So any question on, on a trust transfer grant deed? I don't have any questions on that particular deed. But one of the things that people are asking has to do with the parent-child transfer and I'm actually telling them that you're gonna give us a class on that and that this is not the appropriate venue right now to deal with parent-child transfer and the difference and all the law that has changed in that. Is that correct? Right, we can do go through that separate, although I can cover, you know, the deed is the same. The deed is very basic. Um, it just says whoever, let's say the parents want to add their kid to title. Their parents would be on, on the, the, the deed grant here by grants too and then typically it's they're adding the children so they'll say the parents names and uh this this son's name single man as joint tenants or whatever um and then the the codes would be a little different on the face of the deed the rnt code would be a little different um, although it's still going to be like 11 9 30 but here in this section here, the language is going to be a little different for the no transfer tax due if it's applicable. Um, I have a whole template of, of those, the language that are associated with each of the RT codes. So, um, in fact, let me just do that. I may as well look at that. Let's see. I can send this to you as well if you wish. This is a list of all the, the general RT codes that I use. I, I very rarely use this 19 or 11, 11, 9, 11. Uh, I know Santa Clara County doesn't like it, but Sacramento County does. It's, it's just one of those things. That's the only county that I've seen that I, I tried to use a, a gift transfer 11, 9, 30 to Sacramento. They rejected it and wanted 11, 9, 11. Uh, it's, it's not, it wouldn't be nice if all the time counties were uh, consistent, but it's such as it is. Um, 11925D is a, is a transfer where you're, somebody's transferred into an LLC or out of an LLC and there's no proportional interest ownership change. We could do a whole class on that because there's other documents that are associated with that. But the parent to child specifically, I typically use this. It's this, this section right here. No transfer tax due. This is a conveyance. Uh, it's a bona fide unilateral gift between parent and their children and all meets all these qualifications set forth in 6300. Now, that's assuming that it does. 
Now, to meet the claim for reassessment exclusion requirements, parents have to live in the property and the children have to live in the property. Uh, and, uh, and, and and so that's otherwise the, the 64, the 63.1 doesn't apply and you don't even have to worry about the claim for reassessment exclusion. They're just going to get reassessed. Okay. So that's kind of the, the and then there's the form itself that, um, that you'd have to look at the, the, the P19 nowadays, it's called P19. Um, but that's just a matter of filling that out properly, and it's, it's very basic information there and having them sign it. So I hope that kind of gives some brief. And, that, and, and then if there's anything you need, I can send you templates uh, regarding the, um, the uh, a specific deed that would address a transfer between parent and child, if you like. I, I can send you some examples of that. We're going to bombard you and say any family, anybody who wants deed information from Rob, I put in his contact. And remember, he is president of our association, so his contact information is on calda.org. Rob, you're at 1240. You have 20 minutes, please. Okay, so the next one we can look at, and I'm sorry I don't have right off the bat a, a sample of that um, parent-to-child transfer in front of me here. Um, I'd have to search for that and take some time, but... The next one we'll do is just a, it's an interspousal grant deed as well. And there may be some differences here. So again, procedures are the same. I got the questionnaire from this client. Uh, oh, this is a little different here. This is from an LLC. Yeah, this is, a, this is the property was in an LLC, or at least part of it was. So we can look at the deed. She wanted to take it out of her LLC and uh, place it into husband and wife. So this is how the deed was that was recorded back in 2018. And they bought this from a builder. You can see Robson Homes, LLC. So that was a brand new home. Uh, first, first inhabitants, right? Horace is the husband. And for whatever reason they, they did this, I, I don't know, but it is what it is. So the husband was on title separately, uh, and the LLC, the wife's LLC, was on title, and that's tenants in common. So by default, 50-50. Husband owned it 50%, the LLC owned it 50%, right? So what they wanted to do was first transfer the property uh, get it out of the LLC. So there's one deed that I drafted up that said Trizan Properties LLC hereby grants all of its interest in subject property. And I like to use that language rather than hereby grants 50% of the property. Well, you know, 50% of the property, does that mean it's 50% of the whole property or 50% of the 50% of Trizan's interest? I don't like to deal with numbers. It confuses things or confuses my simple mind. So I like to keep it very basic and say all of its interest, whatever that interest is, it happens to be 50%, but all of it, just whatever it's going, her interest, that LLC's interest in the property is going to uh, the spouse, the marry, a married woman. Okay. And then I like to put this little language in here as well, the result in title, telling the county and whoever needs to talk, pull a deed next time and and, uh, and one of them wants to know exactly what the title is on the property. Horace Ng, a married man, and Tuyet Boo, a married woman, as tenants in common. That's by default, that's what it's going to be. It was in tenants in common with the husband and the LLC. The Now the LLC, uh, the wife, who is the sole manager of that LLC, is, uh, is going to own that 50%. And then she signs that. And then... What the county wants to see is they want to see a copy of the operating agreement, uh, and they want to see this. This is the language they want to see. It's called a declaration letter. And what the well, county wants to see, kind of a logical progression of what's going on. They want to see what's happening, and, and they want to, the, the transfer order to declare that this is real. So to Yed Boo, authorized signator for that LLC, says that, under penalty of perjury and all that, the 50% interest in that APN number, the real property located at that address, 
from the LLC to to yet uh, is exempt from transfer tax pursuant to this R&D code. Um, and she is the sole member of that LLC. Uh, the LLC is the vested owner of 50% of the subject property, and Tuyet will be 50% vested owner in that in that property, right? So they want to see that in black and white. Um, and then let's go back to that deed. And then the language on the deed, right? The RT code is declared up at the top here. There's no transfer tax. No transfer tax due. This is in Fremont, so there's no city transfer tax. So this transfer is between individuals and a legal entity that results solely in the change in a method of holding title to the realty and in which proportional interest ownership in the realty remain the same immediately after transfer. Right. So that's telling the county what's happening on the deed. It's backing up it up with that uh, with that uh, declaration letter. And the second step she wanted was that that property uh, then would go, as we saw the result in title on that first deed, Horace Ng, a married man, and Tuyet Boo, a married woman, tenants in common, grants to Horace Ng and Tuyet Boo, husband and wife, as community property with right of survivorship. Right? So, you know, if, if we had said, if we had had a deed, there's one deed that said Horace Ng uh, and um, the, the LLC name grants to Horace Ng and Tuyet Boo, husband and wife, as community property, that would trigger a reassessment. Um, because of the way the, the, Tuyet was the only member of that LLC. So it, it had to be done in two steps. First, taking it out of the LLC so that the sole member, that, that deed with, that transferred that, that interest from the LLC to Tuyet as sole member was excluded from reassessment and transfer tax and all that because there was no proportional interest ownership change. Just for her 50%, or the LLC's 50%. Resulting in Horace and Tuyet on title as tenants in common 50% each. So Horace didn't change any ownership there. Then from them, both of them as 50% owners to themselves as husband and wife maintains that 50% ownership. And again, no ownership change, no reassessment. So we're trying to help the client re avoid that reassessment and any transfer tax that might be due on the market value of the property to get pretty steep. So yeah, that was the um, that was an interesting one too. Was the LLC and interspousal grantee tied up in one? Um, so, any any questions on that? Again, we're not getting specific questions, but we have uh, one of the questions that asks um, the RNT. Does your client does your customer give you the RNT? Uh, no, I have all the RNT codes. I just they just tell me what they need to do, right? Uh, and and they, they tell me they want no proportional interest ownership change. They want to be they want to um, avoid any reassessment. So then that's the definition of that RNT code. Okay. Okay, and I'm looking for one. I noticed that there's no notary fee. Are they included in your three hundred dollar fee? Yes, because I'm the own, I'm the notary. So when we meet at my office, I notarize, and so my notary fee is encompassed in that fee. Now, if, if I had a client that uh, wasn't able to come into my office, I have I use SnapDocs, right, and I can just schedule a notary, and then that notary fee would be included in that uh, the notary and the FedEx return fee would be included in that fee statement as well. Um, uh, one of the questions had to do with what about title insurance? I'm not quite sure what that question is in reference to, but someone's asking what about title insurance? Right. So title insurance, I obviously, I don't issue title insurance. That's a title company. And, um, the, and I, and I tell them about that. It's part of the disclosure. There's a line item on the disclosure that talks about title insurance. And then if, if, uh, and I tell them that they would have to talk with their title company if there's any issues. But normally it's not an issue, right? If somebody owns a property and um, they let's say they're on title, they're adding their spouse. They purchased the property alone several years ago. When they purchase the property, typically there's title insurance issued uh, with that purchase just by default. Now, 
these days, I believe, at least when I was leaving title companies, doing these type of signings for the loan packages, they were be, they were starting to be required to tell the client that title insurance was optional because it could be a little bit expensive or some of the added fees. But um, so uh, I don't know. In other words, the, the when someone buys a house, they could opt out of having title insurance at all. Uh, if they have it though, and they're just adding a spouse, that's not going to change the coverage of the title insurance. In fact, title insurance that was issued after 2005 even covers if someone owns property as husband and wife and they want to transfer it into their um, trust, they're still covered with the title insurance originally issued. Um, the only way title insurance would just go away is say the parents just gifted the property 100% to their kids or you know the, the original owners that were issued the title insurance came off title of the property. That title insurance would, would go away and they wouldn't be covered anymore. Thank you. Rob, one of the questions is where can you, where can they get a list of the R&T codes? I'll, I'll send them to you. Okay. Oh, they're also, they're, they're, I got them, I think. I compiled this list over the years and I'm sure the Sacramento Law Library, but I can give you the ones I have, yeah. All right, and that is a very good segment. You only have 10 more minutes and actually I'm gonna say you only have about seven or so. So if you, I don't know how many more deeds you're going to be going over. Well, you know what? I just got one more. Okay, go for it. Okay. Uh, this is one that I'm just preparing today. And um, in this case, this client gave me a hand questionnaire. So I had to transpose that right into the notes. Um, in this case, what's happening here is um, the parents who are on title as trustees of their trust are selling their uh, property to their kids, their, their son and then spouse, to their trust. So their sale of the property is $832,000. Um, it's in Indian Wells down in Riverside County. So I prepared the standard legal document uh, contract, didn't change any. Uh, and, and so in this case, here's the, the fee statement. Now, this is one thing about this. I, I, I like to have things automated. You know, I, I the simpler, the better, the quicker, the better. It's more efficient. I'm, I'm producing a product like an assembly line. I want to get it done as quick as possible. Um, so in this case, the fee for the preparation is the same. Um, they're not occupying the property. In fact, I I don't know if it's just vacant land or what, but they were, they're not occupying the property, so the fee is $100 to record. And then for the transfer tax, uh, I just plugged the number in here too, right? It's the, He said $832,000 purchase price. This automatically calculates what the transfer tax is going to be, 100%. And then I'll say that they were adding the kids and it was only 50%. They would calculate it appropriately, right? In this case, uh, in Indian Wells, I looked it up, there's no city transfer tax there's just a county transfer tax at a dollar ten per thousand so about 1.1 1 .1 times 832 is 915 dollars and 20 cents all right so typically what i do is when i meet with these people i'll collect a separate check payable to the clerk recorder for that 915 20 and a separate check for my fees and the recording fees and i'll submit that through usps certified mail into the county um, and then on the deed itself, there's no R&T code, right? Because it's a sale, right? There's no revenue and taxation code that would exclude it from any transfer tax or reassessment. It's going to be reassessed. So I put that 91520 up here. And then I, over here, I just let the county know what, what, um, uh, how I calculated it based on the market value of 832. Okay, uh, so that's just an example of what, and I rarely do sale documents like this, but it is just as basic as anything else. You just, the owners currently, the parents, trustees of the trust are transferring to, now I, I'm, I just found out, the, I just confirmed the names of the people, but um, it'll be the son and the daughter-in-law trustees of that trust. And they sign it. I, and I'll, like I said, I'll send this in USPS certified mail rather than e-report. 
Um, and I think that's it. There's no... Now, what I do with the PCOR in that case is I just put it out there. It is what it is, right? It's a transfer between parent and child, but the parents were not living in the property, so I marked that appropriately. Let's see if I can expand this here so I get it. Uh, right, so that's telling the county, okay, it was a parent to child transfer, but they're, they're not going to have to worry about that P19, that parent to child transfer exclusion, because it doesn't apply. They're not living there, and it's a sale. Right. Well, primarily they're not living there, is what I guess if it was a sale, they might still qualify, but uh, still, it's not. It's, it's not qualified, so I didn't fill out any P19 for them. So I'm letting the county know what the purchase price was. So that's the only difference with the PCOR in that case. Yeah, so that's uh, that's the last bit I've got here. Okay, you ready? You ready? How do you handle a rejected deed that you file? Do you resubmit it at a, to your client? Well, if there's if I made an error, I'm going to fix it, right? So, so no, the client doesn't have to deal with that at all. Okay, and then how about this one? Um, okay, he said got it. Uh, well, let me try to get to decipher this one. To be clear, as a legal notary, one can notarize a deed that they are doing as a licensed LDA and. and we're not licensed LDA, we are registered LDA. So can you act as a notary and notarize a document that you prepared as a LDA? Yes, absolutely. I can equivocally say that because that was the one question on my mind. There were two questions on my mind when I when I started this and I joined Calda. I'm registered in, in, in Santa Clara County. Can I do docs for anybody else in any other counties? The answer is yes there. And uh, the other question was, can I notarize docs that I prepare? And absolutely, yes, you can do that, right? You're kind of putting, the, putting two hats on. You're preparing the docs with one hat on. When you're meeting with the clients and you're, you come to the point where you're notarizing, you put your notary hat on, so to speak, right? So, yeah, you can do that. But if you look at, like, escrow and companies, escrow officers prepare all the documents. Now, they, they kind of don't do this anymore, but they used to notarize their own docs, too when they went to meet with their clients at the refi or the sale of property. I mean, nowadays they have separate notaries to do it, but yes, yes, the answer is yes. Okay, Rob, here's a good good question for you. Do you pull only the last recorded deed or the last two deeds? A senior escrow officer told me she pulls two. That's just the statement that was said. If, if I think that uh, what I pull is I pull a history, first of all, uh, let me see if I can when I pull docs, I pull three things from the portal that I need to look at. And I pull, here's, I pull the history of the property so I can see what's going on with the history. If there's any doubt in my mind, I certainly review different, uh, go back further. Uh, and I pull the deed. Um, and this was, well, that's the deed there that I pulled. This is the last deed that I pulled on this one in particular. Um, and in this one, right, there there wasn't really any necessity to, to go back it further because this this was a sale of the property, right? We can tell because they charged transfer tax. And it went from these totally different people, Philippe or Philip Ryan Grote and his spouse or trustees, to uh, Philippe, uh, Philippe and Linda as joint tenants. So, you know, there was no doubt about that. That's what it was. But yeah, if I have to, I'll pull, I'll go back as far as I think is necessary. Okay, so here's a question. In our contract, the flat fee states that the fee includes all costs, expense, et cetera. Is it okay to add the cert mail or e-recording fee? Well, in the, in the, um, I, I refer to the fee statement when I, when, in that contract, but the fee that I quote in the contract is the bottom line here, including recording fees and all that. If it uh, if it requires, um, let's see, if it requires transfer tax, I'll make note of that in in that section. But here's what it says here: uh, flat fee, the total amount of 360 for all services costs. So yeah, 
that refers to this attached fee statement. So all those fees are itemized on the fee statement, but totaled up here. And again, if I had to charge the client transfer tax, I would have just placed in there plus transfer tax. Mm -hmm. That's not really my fee anyway, right? It's a county fee. Hey, here's a good question. What information do you provide to guide the <laughs> to guide the client to a grant deed versus a quick claim deed? That's a good one. Okay, so on the questionnaire and in my on my site, let me see. I'll pull something. Well, we just saw something in here. I think it was Hawker. So in the uh, the state the the disclosures and the so when I originally place this out to the client uh, requesting information from them, I'll give them the property transfer tax questionnaire and the brochure. Uh, so that's what that's all the information there. That's it's everything is there as a definition of what those deeds are. Uh, in this on my questionnaire as well though, it also defines them here. So they know what they want me to do for them. So then they initial what they're telling me to prepare. So they have a couple of resources. This questionnaire, the exact questionnaire, they're gonna they're gonna click off and tell me what to do. But there's also the, the brochure that I provide them at the same time, so they have reference to that. Uh, Rob, it's one o'clock. Is it? Yeah, it is. It is one o'clock, and I still have 18 questions that I'm trying to get through. You guys uh, really. Uh, made me see if I could um, get through all your questions. I apologize. I did not. We've got to um, appreciate your time. So, Rob, they're going to be calling you. So I suggest you just get prepared that the members are going to be calling you. And again, thank you, Inland Empire, for allowing us to take up your chapter time. Rob, this lets you know we got to have another class. We have to have another class because we got a lot of questions. Sorry about that, gang. Yeah, no, it was suggested at one point that we do like a boot camp type of thing. Well, I think you have enough information to do that. So we will talk with administration and see when we can do this. That was a lot of information. Everybody say thank you to Rob and go back to work. Go make some money and be the best LDA that you can out there, okay? Thank you all. Thank you, Rob. Uh, participants have raised their, three participants have raised their hand. Those who have raised their hands, please contact Rob via email. Remember, he is actually uh, running a business also, but, you, uh, but he is more than uh, happy to give you his time. But please be respectful of his time as well, okay? We are now ending the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. All right, bye.